I'm super excited to have Matthias today in the interview, and he's the founder of Passion.io. And welcome, Matthias, for this interview. Thank you for having me. So I'm super excited, Matthias, uh, to talk about your uh, project Passion.io. I'm super curious to know everything about how you built this company, how you scaled it, in what phase you are actually are. But I would start with a very common question. What is Passion.io and who is it for? Okay, good question. So Passion.io is in the creator economy and we help creators and they also call themselves quite often instructors, trainers, teachers, professionals, tr consultants, and so on, um, to launch an app under their own brand to really delight and impact their, their customers with the mobile first features out there that you know from many apps, for example, from Headspace, like really cool audio from WhatsApp, um, to do chat, for example, and bring all of that into your own app that you mm -hmm. can launch with full control and very, very easily. So the idea was, and this is something that I got from your website and the stuff that I saw that one of the biggest problems as a content creator is how to make money, right? And your app and passion IO is a great way to build your own community of a platform and to find ways to build an online course, to do live calls, to do community and find a way, long way to monetize your audience, right? Yeah, that's correct. I would say creators today, they um, struggle. There are multiple reasons for that. One is they're essentially on their phone today, like we're all on our phone, wh wherever you are, and you have to stitch together fragmented web tools built for mm -hmm. desktop computers. Um, in Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok is all apps, right? But you still have to use the web. And then um, secondly, these big platforms that I just uh, mentioned are controlling everything through the algorithms, the distribution, the brand, and you do not even have access to contact your, or to get the email addresses of your, of your, of your mm -hmm. people. <laughs> and then uh, lastly, to really make money today as a creator, many do third party promotions, holding something in the camera, trying to make it very authentic, but it's very obvious that it's inauthentic. If you speak to them, they say that they really love to have impact on their audience and to excite them and to actually also make a business with that. Mm -hmm. The issue is only the most successful creators today um, do that successfully. They launch their own products. Kali Jana has done that, created a billion dollar business with her own makeup line. Um, Kyla, it seems another one from the, from Australia created a 400 million business with her own fitness app. And ultimately um, it's about launching and creating your own products that sell instead of s selling time for money and doing inauthentic third party collaborations. Mm -hmm. And something that I, that I find very curious, and this is something that I want to know more about is the thing that you don't just give the people your app and have fun with it, that you really try everything to get them started within the first like 30 days, right? To get started with your app, really get to know how it works and especially how they can use it to get the people or their community into the app and monetize it. Can you something tell us something about these challenges that you implemented? Because I found that really, really interesting. Yeah, that's right. As a creator, you're essentially an entrepreneur and mm -hmm. To fail as an entrepreneur is very easy. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot about not just having the best tools, but also the best education and the right mindset. Mm -hmm. So quite early on, we created, I would not just say, even say a, a non-boarding training, but a boot camp, mm -hmm. which is 30 days long where you become a better creator. And if you're starting out on how to actually start successfully to make your first revenues within the first two weeks, even. Mm -hmm. And after you're through that program, you will have made, you know, launched your first product, have your first customers, made four figures, and then you can go into advanced programs that will take you then up to a six figure business um, that is much more automated than the first thing that you're launching. Yeah, so it's not just about the software, it's also about the education and the right mindset to become successful as a creator. 
this is something that I find really interesting because most of the apps and most of the platforms that I know is that you log in. And I think that the developers and the founders always know how it looks like, how to use it. But in most cases, I find myself some kind of lost in all these interfaces and buttons. And I think along the, along the way, they sometimes are like, ah, maybe we do some kind of academy or a course where we teach some stuff. But I found that really interesting, your approach that you put like the education, some kind of first, and the app is just the tool to implement this stuff to help the content creators to, to get their first product launched. Yeah. That's right. We, we started as an agency in the very beginning and we really saw what successful creators are doing to mm -hmm. successfully launch seven figure products, mm -hmm. um, what market, what price points, how to build out the funnels, what product really clicks and converts ultimately. And then we took that learning and created an education out of this, which sits on top of our software. And um, through doing that, we also learned what features are missing, what drives most value to also the end users, to so the customers mm -hmm. of our customers, and to to build the software very market driven, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And you said it, because this would be a question that I'm really interested in, is like, how did you come up with the idea? Because it's not like I, I would assume that you're, uh, I have an idea for an <laughs> app, but you said it before that you started an agency or that you started as an agency, you had your case. And how many agency clients did you do? And did you do it like worldwide or did you specialize in only the States or where did you do it? Good question. The backstory is I became one of the bigger instructors on Udemy with mm -hmm. more than 40,000 ah. students under my belt. Mm -hmm. I was back then teaching Excel courses. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't very, even though I had so many students, I didn't make a lot of money and I got really, let's say, annoyed by Udemy that I don't have access to my uh, students. Um, they were always pricing specials. I never really made a lot of money and I saw the most successful instructors leaving to other platforms such as Teachable, Thinkific, Kajabi. I checked these as well and then I decided, actually, I'm also not happy with, with these. I will just build mm -hmm. this thing myself. Mm -hmm. I was very naive about it, um, built the first prototype. And then once I came out, I launched my course myself in the beginning it, it worked pretty well and then i was thinking okay what if actually i bring other creators on on the platform and then i can leverage myself much more so i reached out to people um, in germany as well but also across the globe mm -hmm. and the people that were most open were the americans mm. Back then, it was very easy, for example, to speak with Tony Horton. Tony Horton um, is the inventor of P90X, which is mm -hmm. the highest grossing fitness program on the planet um, with more than a billion in sales. He was like the inventor of um, fitness on demand on, on television and just like had a call. It's like, hey, let's work together. Okay, done deal. Right. And that was very, very difficult in, in Germany for some reason. So the first customers were Americans. We did everything for them from A to Z, including flying them in and producing and post-production and marketing and customer service and tech and, and all of that. And um, we then split revenues, actually profits 50-50. Cool. And um, had then a few customers made seven figures with that. And Crazy. then said, okay, let's actually scale that system, German style. Um, and instead of three customers, we do it with 30, then 300, yeah. 3000. And we minimize production times. We optimize German script. engineering. Yeah. But we couldn't handle the demand. And we had also a lot of inbound requests from creators where we knew oh, it's a lot of effort to actually produce and to do the whole thing. And we are not sure if we can make this person successful. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so we were in a situation like every um, investor, venture capitalist is, or also what every music level is struggling with, like who are the next big shots that will actually um, create Got it. success and, yeah. and profit. And the most obvious answer here was, let's build a software out of this, because then creators can do it themselves. And we just take a subscription fee for that, potentially down the road, participate in the revenues that they are making, but the much, much smaller share. Mm -hmm. And that is then ultimately a software business, similar to what Shopify is doing, but for the creator economy with mobile apps. Okay. Got it. I'm a little bit curious about the perfect 
uh, launch when I'm a creator. Can you tell us a little bit what kind of funnel product and promotion you did with these bigger, bigger content creators in these days, how it looked like? Yeah. Back in the days, and that's also different to today because not everyone has big audiences. Not everyone mm -hmm. has already uh, a niche that is clear and, and they need to find it. And that's all something that we provide today. But back in the days, we were only like betting on these, on these creators. So when we started, we had no idea. Um, we started with one-time offers. So you pay, let's say $27, 49, 97, usually not more expensive than that to buy a digital program. Mm -hmm. In the very early days, even a course on the web. And then it was obvious that all customers wanted to have apps. So then we, we pivoted there, but um, that's what we did first. And then we learned from that, that we make, um, we get some, some revenue. We can actually get much more revenue if we do a launch. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that means we promote something that happens on a specific day and then you can only buy it. Then it will never come again. And then it's like closed. And then we maybe do another launch a quarter later. So what that leads to is revenue spike, nothing, revenue spike, usually a smaller revenue spike even, and then nothing again. Um, and even no upsell, even with just a product. We had no clue what upsells were. We had no clue what upsells were like back then. That was some time ago. And then we were like, okay, we have to, to actually increase. We have to yeah. do upsells, so increase the basket per customer. Um, but <laughs> also these spikes are not nice. We want to have yeah. consistent income. So we have to add the recurring component mm -hmm. to that. And then we, um, we figured out how we can create almost cost life structures, which are primed in my opinion, to be a one time mm -hmm. to actually make that exciting, um, that it makes sense and it justifies a recurring price for that. And people okay. invest over and over again. And, um, yeah. And that were then, for example, multi like consecutive challenges that you can do. Mm -hmm. Um, it was also bringing community in and accountability that people keep on going. Um, it's ultimately like an endless progress. You can always level up mm -hmm. and, and it's away from like, Hey, I'm listening to 20 lessons and that that's it. Yeah. Okay. And how did you do like in case of the subscription model, how did you do like the splitting of the profits after several months? And then you said a hey, creator, this is the rest is yours. Or how did you find a good deal? Because it's. It's very interesting case, I think. Yeah, back then we did monthly payouts. So every ah, month okay. we wired, we wired yeah. um, money to the creators. Yeah, cool. That's really interesting because I think a lot of people struggle with this launch cycle that they launch like, I don't know, three or four times a year. And these are the months where they earn their money. But if a launch fails, there are like yeah, really, really scared that the whole year is like gone. And I really like your approach that is really has something to do with like framing and really to say like, because even if you do a course for a month, it's not over how to implement it to get like community to get other people help you along the way. I really yeah. like that idea. Yeah, you know, the big the big learning from that was actually that many creators think they need Number one, to have a big audience, but also to have a lot of content, big library, mm -hmm. a big course, let me mm -hmm. produce all of that and then sell that for $29. But that is not going to be successful because you don't know if that's really what your customers want. Mm -hmm. And then what we learned from the old days was let's actually um, first sell something which is not recurring and um, also works with just a few customers and sell it at a higher price point, almost that it's like a coaching offer. Mm -hmm. And then like be with the customers, make them accountable. And it feels to them like you are there with them, get personal feedback. And therefore you can justify that higher price point and you actually learn from these customers what they really need. And there mm -hmm. you are founding members and with them, you, you see what, what language they use, what pain points they have and where they actually get value from. And only then you, you, you build the product out of this because that will then have product market fit. That is then what the market wants. And, and that step is really important to, to first work very closely with your customers, understand their pain points, and then build something which is scalable and can be consumed asynchronously while you're like somewhere else. This is really one of the, the main concepts that I really like is this evolution from like 
done for you to done with you to like an online course. And I think most of the people do it like the wrong way. They do like, here is the online course, have fun and never had the proof what you said, like, is it working or not for the clients? And this is something that I think creates these online courses where there are like a thousand videos in there, but people don't consume it until the end. And in the worst case, they don't get any results. And I see it, especially along the way we have learned that we reduced our videos more and more in each segment where we work with customers together and really focused what are the points that really make a difference. What do they need to know? And it shifted everything because the customer, they don't, or the clients, they don't have to consume that much and they get even faster results. And this is something that is really good that you teach your content creators that you don't have this giant content library, that this is not the, the part that sells at the end. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's really interesting that you got to this point. And so the agency wasn't it, it was like software. And is it this evolution from, um, consulting Excel on Udemy to programming your own software or how did this <laughs> became a thing or did you, have you had some experience in coding before? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I studied business and IT mm -hmm. back in the days. I would say though, I didn't really learn in university how to really code. I wasn't the guy that like started when they, when, when I don't know, I was 10 years old or so. So <laughs> I was always into business and buying and selling yeah. and, and making, um, making money. You can argue, but, but yeah. not into tech, even though I studied that. Mm -hmm. And then I like sold my previous venture to a competitor and I felt like I could have done everything there from a to z except the tech part mm -hmm. and i really envy the tech guy because he the cto he was able to do um magic with just a few lines steps. of code yeah, yeah. it's like this is amazing right and like <laughs> if i can do that if i could do that then i can build whatever i do not need um to raise funds I don't need to convince people. I can just like build what I want, um, become successful. And then it's also easier to convince whoever, if it's investors or co-founders or team members or, um, whatever then, then at that point. And I went into web development back then with rails, mm -hmm. we on rails tested a bit there. And, and the first half year, the first six months were devastating. It was ridiculous, like how bad I was. Um, but then at some point something good came out of it. Yeah. It's a long journey or not, isn't it like learning a new language that it takes quite some iterations to, to get the concepts and to learn how to code? Yeah. Yes. And no, I would, I wouldn't say I'm actually a good coder. Um, mm -hmm. I, I came from this business background and I learned quite quickly. Okay. Actually there's a lot of libraries and <laughs> ah, you okay. can like pull them together as you need. And you're almost like, like Tetris, you build stuff mm -hmm. and plug it together and I was always looking for getting quickest to the prototype mm -hmm. that I can see if I have a viable business. So I was never mm -hmm. kind of like coding uh, for the sake of coding. I was more yeah. building prototypes and MVPs, if that makes sense. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So you started coding this thing. You started having like a prototype and I got like that you at some point, uh, got a partner, right? For like the marketing site uh of passion io how did this become reality yeah that's dan passion dan and passion matt he he is the face of the company um after the first three customers we we met and immediately clicked and 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 the rest is history more or less but yeah no, we have then first first started the german style right to, to optimize processes up to 30 people but mm -hmm. then we we said okay software is actually the thing that makes it really scalable and shortly thereafter we then together um, cracked a hundred customers. Then I think it was 118 year one, then 800 in year two, then, um, three, 4,000 the year after. And now we are yeah, at 6,000 customers, 10 million annual recurring revenue, which is kind of like the yardstick. Thank you. It's the yardstick in the, in the market for not being a startup anymore, but a scale up. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's 10 million per year is like one of the metrics to not being a starter at M anymore, or what is it? 
Oh, that's how I see it. Like 10, 10 yeah. million is really the, the threshold where all of a sudden all the growth investors are, are becoming interested. Uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah, then the next one is maybe 25 and then a hundred and then maybe a billion <laughs> in ARR. <laughs> yeah. Sounds so reachable. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. If you look at Kajabi, they, they were able to get to 120 recently pretty, yeah, just with subscriptions. Mm -hmm. If you want to do billions. So Shopify, mm -hmm. then you need to crack payments as well, mm -hmm. because ultimately, um, yeah, to become really scalable and successful, you have to participate a bit in the success of your, ah, okay. of your creators. You have to make them successful and you can participate in them. Um, and Shopify makes of every last dollar that they make three payment dollars. Mm -hmm. And only because of that, they, uh, they reach 1 billion ARR. Yeah. But let's, let's zoom a little bit in, into this growth that you had from like zero to 180 to 800 to three or 4,000, 6,000. What were like the main funnels and the main concepts to get the people in? Because I'm a little bit curious about that. That's a good question. One thing that we have learned from the time before on how to sell successfully um, with funnels and launches and webinars, we applied for software as well. Mm -hmm. So it also made sense because the product in the very beginning wasn't there. It was, it was not even, it was an alpha MVP, whatever you want to call it, it was, was yeah. very, very simple. And we, we launched a webinar in January, 2019, first live webinar, then iterated the webinar. Many, many Dan did that for 20, 30 times until we were able to record the webinar. Mm -hmm. and we're selling a six month annual upfront on the software before it then goes into a recurring or actually, yeah, it's like it's an upfront price for a six month access ah, okay. and then it's recurring. And that allowed us to become break even on um, performance marketing. Mm -hmm. So Got it. we were profitable. We are still are profitable on the marketing that we do on the first order. So we can, that's impressive. Yeah. We can scale up and make immediately uh, break even and everything thereafter is then uh, margin mm -hmm. and this margin pays the bills. So with that, we can finance the tech team, uh, the marketing team and all other people in the company. And it really was like the process that I think, yeah, the award in the back of our both, uh, cameras isn't the same, but I think it's a word from the same guy. And he's Russell is one of the main guys. I think he said that you're just one webinar, some kind of a way that you and have to way. iterate and funnel. Yeah. Right. And you have to iterate it several times. And just what you said, like doing it 20 or 30 times to really nail it. And then you to automate it is like the best process to scale your company. Right. And I find it really clever what you're saying to get the price for the first six months up front so that you're really profitable in the beginning and get the people into your uh, subscription model after that, right? Yeah, and, and I think it's also good for everyone because we are both in the same boat. We, we have an incentive to really make sure that they become successful uh, and to be upfront with all that information. If you would just sell education, which many coaches yeah. are doing, then you have to like lock all of that stuff behind the paywall. We can be upfront about it. So, so that's one thing. And then what Russell did with you're just one funnel away, in my opinion, is the commercialization of a language where ultimately he, he's teaching how to create product market fit. Because mm -hmm. um, if you have a landing page or a funnel um, with upsells, ultimately someone has to say, this is exactly what I want. It solves my problems. I'm buying and so on. So he's creating product market fit. Um, and that's also what we are teaching with, with our, uh, programs and, and with the tools itself on how to become a creator that is ultimately successful and becomes independent financially, uh, location wise and time wise, because if you look at like, even at the marketplaces and with marketplaces, I mean, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, why does someone have 600 K followers? Why does someone have 30 followers? Um, and even then you can talk about the quality of the followers. If you are, let's say a very attractive woman, um, quite often they have 98% male followers from, uh, from very different countries than where the purchase yeah. power is. So, you know, how, if you create something where you have a loyal, strong following that is, yeah, very close to you, 
then you have found product market fit mm -hmm. you know, on the content, mm -hmm. on the message that you're having and that you can monetize. So ultimately there's as well about product market fit and, um, it's everything is actually about product market fit. And Russell has done that in a way where he talks about funnels to create product market fit. Yeah. I think this is something that most of the people don't have on their map when they're trying to, I don't know, do like on online advertising or to get new clients. And this is something as, as someone who like sells that in consulting and in coachings and stuff like that. It's something that no one wants to buy. If you talk about like product market fit or the offers or the messages, everybody wants to have the fancy funnel or LinkedIn ads, or I don't know what it is, but it's, you're absolutely right. I think in 90% of the cases, it's something with the product market fit that is not given yet that you can advertise the product or the offer yet now and this is really interesting and russell did really a uh, really good job on this part yeah so this is really good to hear that you were profitable with uh the webinar that's that sounds really really good and and you had a little bit like what would you say there there should be or there is i think in the mind of your customers or clients this question what is the difference to a kajabi do you have an answer to that if people, I would assume they compare you to other platforms that offer that kind of service, right? Yeah, we have people from Kajabi coming over as well. I would say Kajabi <laughs> is really good. Um, it's an all-in-one solution for your knowledge <laughs> business, they call it, for courses, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you can also be emailing with that and so on. What, how we are different is instead of like doing courses, which in my opinion is the old world, the new world is... You do something which is more interactive. We call it experiences inside of an app. So for example, why do you meditate with Headspace and not through an online course? Because mm -hmm. Headspace is just a nicer experience, right? Yeah. So with Passion, you can create an experience inside uh, an app, which is straight in the face of your customers um, mm -hmm. because it's on the phone. And um, the second thing, it's mobile first. So all the no code builders and if that is kajabi for courses or shopify for shops um, wix for web pages and wordpress for blogs they are all made for web you build on your desktop computer and you then deliver via browser but the whole creator economy the audiences and also the core apps there instagram facebook TikTok, everything is mobile so mm -hmm. what we are going after is you build on the phone you ship on the phone, you monetize on the phone, you run your whole business on the phone. And, and that's where the difference is. To give you another like quick story, how that resonates, um, take the dating market. In the dating market, back in the days, everyone was saying it's super crowded. There was eHarmony in the US, there was Match, and every country there was just like, like a lot of players and it was a red ocean, mm -hmm. very bloody. And then Tinder came. And Tinder approached it with a mobile first approach with proximity based dating, with swiping and all of a sudden Tinder took the market by storm. So they did it mobile first and that's what we are doing as well. So for that reason, Tinder cannot really be compared to eHarmony. It's a very different play. Mm. And we deliver therefore mobile first experiences, which is very different than Kajabi. One thing that I didn't know, and this is really exciting, I think, is that um, Kajabi is really appearing to course owners, so into yeah, simple courses, they may be doing some coaching, one-on-one -on -one upsells, um, some personal feedback and so on. But the creator spectrum out there, the creator economy is much wider. And there are some people that are into community a lot, into streaming, into interactive content, what you know from Headspace, but maybe also in fitness and other verticals, right? So um, all of a sudden, if you bring these best mobile features from other apps onto your own app um, and, and, and branding, then you all of a sudden unlock access to the whole creator spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that means Kajabi is actually a vertical solution for experts, for knowledge entrepreneurs, you can say. Maybe you can say Twitch is like also a vertical solution for gamers and streamers. Mm -hmm. And then you have like the only horizontal layer is the platforms. Yeah, I think Kifi, uh, sorry, TikTok, um, Facebook, Instagram, and so on. But they dictate brand and control everything with algorithms. And that's tough. And complementary is your passion app, which is also horizontal, works across verticals for your smallest little niche. And you can actually promote it really nicely on the big platforms. And that closes the loop to what, what actually has happened on the web, where you have a Shopify, 
where you get no distribution and you have full control and you have Amazon marketplace where you have no control and, but they bring distribution and customers. Yeah, so customers, are they different? Right? Yeah. Yes, they are, but actually complementary. So your Shopify store integrates really seamlessly into your Amazon marketplace mm -hmm. and passion IO integrates really seamlessly and it's really complementary to your, to the platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, where you are. And for that reason, very different to Kajabi, Twitch, and so on and so forth. I hope that answers. I, I, that, that answers that really well. And I'm curious, Matthias, so as a, as a loyal Kajabi client, uh, <laughs> I'm super excited to hear it because we have the case and I would be very curious about that. We have the case that a lot of the stuff that we teach our clients in, in courses right now, where we do give them some kind of lessons so that we don't have to teach it on every call. We do it on Kajabi because the people have to do it on their desktop computer. So they have to use in some cases, LinkedIn, they have to build landing pages. They have to use like email marketing tools, like active campaign. And I tried several times these apps on the mobile phone and I was like, not a chance that you can build something really good on a mobile phone, but do you see a case or do you have cases like in your, in your base where like consulting companies do found a way to use your app? Because mm -hmm. this, this, there is something with this community thing, because I really recognize with like, we have also a lot of like solo entrepreneurs, like coaches and consultants or agency owners. And there is a part of, I can ask someone if I have a question today, or I want, I don't know, I'm sitting in a, in a train I, and I want to listen to some kind of input for my next step. Do you have some, some kind of case studies for consulting companies, how to leverage your app? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I get the question now. We, we have, we do have that mm -hmm. today. Um, we are very agnostic. We have people from the, the very like nichiest business uh, verticals as well. Um, we still have a lot of fitness, like 15%, one five is fitness, but then it becomes super agnostic. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people in the business space use it. Um, one is just their clients tell them like, Hey, I want to have a <laughs> video on my, on my phone. Like when I'm yeah. sitting on my couch down there, I just want to watch that video. Maybe I want to cast it to TV and, and, but just, I want to like watch it at my own terms and, and convenience is like so important. I would say then the second element is that community is actually the centerpiece of, of, of your business ultimately, because, um, that unlocks you to then sell courses, events, uh, upsells, whatever. So everything is about engaging with your, with your, with your people. And where does community, where does social interaction happen? Social interaction happens on your phone. Yeah. You tell, you text people on the phone through WhatsApp to like everything, like all the social interaction happens usually on the phone. You're not going to a computer to like interact with people usually. So it's like primed to do this, to do this on a phone. And, um, and then regarding your email clients, so active campaign, of course, is, is really important. We also use active campaign. Um, but you all of a sudden have an additional channel to get access to your clients, for example, mm -hmm. with push notifications. Mm -hmm. And let's say you want to do an event on Sunday evening at 7 PM and people have to show up, then good luck with your emails. You have to send a lot <laughs> of emails and then you have an opening yeah. rate, click rate. You have to tell people like edit in your calendar with push, you can remind them much better. And if you think this again, really mobile first, then think about WhatsApp, right? With WhatsApp, you can make calls. So mm -hmm. if I call you, then your phone rings. Mm -hmm. So that means we don't have that yet, but uh, we'll have that soon. You can actually create an event where 20 people are um, attending. And then at 7 PM on a Sunday, you make phones ring and then people just click accept and they're right in the call. So that's, that's like a very different use case than what you can do with courses and active campaign on the web. Ah. I got, I gotta admit, Matthias, I'm sold. <laughs> I really want to do the, te and the test because I really see your point because in our space where we are, I think we have the situation that it's kind of crowded. We found along the way a little bit of like 
um, a calm place with LinkedIn. There is not a lot of LinkedIn consulting, especially not a lot of good consulting for this, this part. But I really see your point. Our clients are also every day on their phones. They are using WhatsApp every day. And the only channel that I have today are like LinkedIn and my email list. And if I have ultimately the way to get on their phones and to reach them through another channel, that would yeah. be something that is really interesting. And I saw this trend, especially in the radios here in Hamburg, they all push their listeners to their own apps these days. And I found that really interesting because I never heard that before until I, I think like two or three years ago, they started like, yeah, send us your wishes for the next song in our own app. And now I think I get their concept, like owning their own listeners and try to, or get a way to contact them, not just with their radio frequencies. Yeah. It's an interactive marketing channel. You can argue. And, and, and really, really quick question uh, here. Sure. So the app, I can, I can fully like customize it. It can say like leaders media. Yeah, that's, that's the, that's the whole point. So it's a your branded own app in the app store, play store, also on web. Love it. I'm going to sign up right after this interview. I really <laughs> want to do the test. Really. I would love to test it because. As you said, this is something no one is on the mobile phones in our market. I don't know yet if I can share this interview after talking about this, um, <laughs> because it could be really a huge innovation because this business world, I talk to the people at LinkedIn because they also consult us on LinkedIn ads and we can talk to them. And I was like, summertime, how is it on LinkedIn? And they said, yeah, our engagement is up 15%. And I'm like, why the people are on vacation and they're like, yeah. What are they doing on the beach? They are checking their LinkedIn apps. And I was like, yeah, it makes totally sense. And there is like an audience, a business audience that is every day on their phones, but not in their emails. And this is absolutely a test worthy to try it. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> that is really, really interesting because this mobile first approach is really something that I try to grasp and I think that was something on my mind that, that is really like um, what you said before that is something that is some kind for the people I think attached to fitness and stuff like that because you just need the phone you do like a course or you can do like your exercise routines and that's it and I was like if you need something on your desktop or you need the desktop version of active campaign or click funnels and stuff like that there is no case for that but just what you said with the events and stuff like that and the push notifications, or you're doing a live training or stuff like that, this is so interesting to get the people with one click into that thing. Yeah. Is the what, we, what we also see more coming is in the new hybrid world, right? Where like it's more digital, but also now physical again. If you think about an event and we even do, do this at our team events, we um, we use the app, like everyone gets the app out to do feedback uh, assessments, for example, because everyone has the phone in the pocket, not the computer at hand. And number two, uh, we can also give access at events to certain pieces of content. So I can stand in the front and say, hey, guys, you actually now have content access to this right now. Everyone that is here, you can check it out later in the break or whenever. And, and I can connect like the physical with the digital very effectively because they have the phone in their pocket. That makes sense. Give me, give me some features, Matthias, that I can, that I can use. So there is some kind of events, right? Where I can say that people I'm live right now and you can join. Can I do like presentations in there or is it just with me and my face cam? What options do I have? For presentations, for live presentations, mm -hmm. I would, I would say, um, I mean, you know, like we are a three year old startup and, and it's like a business builder from A to Z with like, you have to have to get the apps, there's courses, mm -hmm. there's community, there's all these things. And, uh, let's say we are a scale up now, but don't expect that you have a better, um, a, a better experience than with zoom, you know, because zoom okay. is just 
bigger and, and more mature, mature and everything. At some point, like our philosophy is, there will always be a simple yet powerful um, native solution for mm -hmm. also live streaming. But um, just put your Zoom link in there. And if you want to use Zoom and you're used to it and your customers mm -hmm. are used to that, then just do that, right? So put the link there. Um, it's still good that you engage them into the app and they click the link and, um, and, and that's like still a value add. But don't expect that we are like better than what Zoom does, what Facebook does, right. what Instagram does, what all the others do, right? Um, it's more like creating this this one central digital version of mm -hmm. Leaders Media, for example, that people have in their pocket, mm -hmm. can access at any point when they want, or you can also nudge them if you want them to. Mm -hmm. And they can then access like online classes, like in, in course form or watch these videos, right? And is there like a community tab where people can like chat and stuff like that? Yeah, exactly. It, it goes more, you know, community is is so differently interpreted by, by many companies. Facebook yeah. does it as a feed. And mm -hmm. the reason why it's a feed, because they had some point had to crack monetization and the feed is something <laughs> where you can put ads in. Yeah. And like, yeah. like between posts, you have then ads. Um, our community is much more like a Slack or Discord mm -hmm. where you have, um, you can also have multiple communities. You maybe have a free community, then you have different channels in there. Uh, and then you may have, have a VIP community that only yeah. people that have a higher price plan uh, or bought a higher price plan have access to, again, with channels, then a member list and also private chats. You can pick if, um, if, if only you can approach directly people or if they can write with each, with each other, if, um, if, if they can ex if they can write you because some creators they do not want that people um, write them unless they are paying for that so mm -hmm. they would only unlock that feature for higher price community plans and uh, yeah you can build a use case that makes sense for you but you have to yeah work work that out what what works for you if that makes mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. that sounds really good i i give it a try because this is something yeah in the in the time of getting the attention of people and i think this is marketing all about and yeah, to get the attention of your of your target group mobile shouldn't be like something that isn't there but it's the most i think the most important channel and if you can put like a digital version of leaders media there uh, i love it yeah yeah so what are the struggles or what are like the topics that you have like as a company of 10 million recurring revenue on your on your list today? What are the struggles that are you fighting every day right now? Yeah, that makes sense. We are largely bootstrapped. We have mm -hmm. some investors, but largely bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. And it's it's hard to deliver on that on that on that like fully loaded product pipeline with the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's not just like Calendly scheduling something and that's it, right? <laughs> like literally, a Calendly is one of the widgets that you can use inside a lesson yeah. of a course of multiple courses and so on that you can build, right? Yeah. So um, it's it's quite complex. It's a lot of work, and we have limited resources. So we have a big backlog of customer requests that we cannot um, fulfill quick enough. Mm -hmm. That's I would say uh, a big challenge. I would say. Um, Another one is apps are still kind of like secluded a bit from the world. What do I mean by that? You need so far a developer account and you then have to be quite technical, then go through a moderation with Apple and Google to eventually get something approved that is then listed in the Apple store or Google play store. It's not like launching a web page with a tab. You all of a sudden have a web page and that's it. Yeah. It's much more complex and you almost have to live in the metrics to make this work. So. We, we, um, created and you system. make it work for your customers. Yeah, we democratize access to, to the app stores by making it really easy to, to achieve that. That is an ongoing process, which we will hundred percent still do in five years and maybe like in 10 years as well to make it automated further and further and further. Yeah. Um, right now you can actually do it if you're like a normal person, like we are. Um, it still is like some, some effort to, to set up the account connected to passion and get your app pushed. But, um, but it's, it's much more convenient. You don't need the developer. You don't need the designer. You can do it by yourself. How I picture this in the future at some point is that there is, um, 
one click like integration one click thing and it's all set up and that's it and for that you for example also have to handle the uh, moderation with apple and google but we know what they what they when they tell us something what the actual best reply is because we have launched thousands of apps right mm. so that can at some point maybe even automate it with uh, you can call it ai or some logic that just gives the right answer and fixes the right thing in order to make the app compliant and launched yeah so that's like the app submission part is certainly something which is um to be improved further I got, a, I got a question for your first point. That is really interesting because especially you said that you're uh, using active campaign as well. This is something that I really recognize with the email uh, marketing tools out there. So I tried, I think several times before, like two, three or four, and most of them were at some point, I think they got more and more requests from clients of features that it got so complex that I was like, I don't even know what it means, this button. What is it for? And I came into the back end of Active Campaign and I was like, it's so refreshing. There are like mm -hmm. just three buttons. I know where to click. I know what the main features are and I know how to use it. And since then, I never tried anything else because I was so happy. But I get the point as a software developer, you get all these feature requests from your clients. How do you? prioritize because I think active campaign developers have to say like 90 95% no to new features. And I think there are a lot of people th saying every day, we want this, we want this, we want this. How do you like navigate this, making your clients happy while keeping it very lean? I think that that, yeah, is, that should it's, be a it's, struggle or not. It's really difficult. It's really yeah. difficult, especially on a mobile device. Everything has to be very simple yet powerful yeah. and, and to work with people that are starting, but also with the bigger ones, right? And they have different requirements. So one thing that definitely helps is to have a very clear product vision mm -hmm. and, and know exactly like what we're working towards. Because then, for example, what you're not doing is, um, hey, we have 15% 15, 15 fitness guys and they say we want to have uh, a nutrition tracker, right? Like, yeah, it's fine, but like our mission is to be the mobile first yeah. tool across, like for, for all verticals. So we do the core and then um, at some point you can have a third party uh, plugin economy where um, third parties develop plugins, similar ah. to what you know from WordPress, Shopify, <laughs> Salesforce, right? So the, all the mass customization um, to verticalize, you do with that. Um, and then you just pull in what you need from like um, a plugin marketplace, right? So. So that's something where then everyone can customize more. We don't have that yet, but it will come. And um, I would say the second really important thing is it's called an ICP, an ideal customer profile to really know mm -hmm. who your ideal customer is and then to be very close to them and, and don't develop towards what everyone is saying because <laughs> yeah. if you, and this is normal in our business, you have a limited amount of people that are hyper successful and you have a lot of people that are like starting out. Mm -hmm. And that is the same for Kajabi, for Shopify, for all the others. Yeah. So if you just hear, hear to the starters, to, to whatever they want or think they want, is, is not necessarily the right thing. Um, you have to manage two, two parties. One is like the successful guys and help them to, to become more successful, that they stay. Mm -hmm. And then you have to make it very easy for the others to replicate that success, that you have an engine where Got it. Um, the small guys are attracted by the big guys, the big guys are happy, stay and attract small guys again. And, and you have to focus that, but in, ultimately it's a very, very, very difficult problem to, to, to solve, especially with the resources that we have and then on a mobile phone screen. I really impressive because I found this with the email marketing tools, a very, very like clear case that it's really a struggle and really difficult to navigate this. Uh, yeah, MailChimp too simple, Infusionsoft or Keep too complicated, HubSpot <laughs> too enterprisey, too expensive. Yeah. You're like. Okay. And then active campaign, we started on $9, like a $9 plan today. We pay a thousand bucks. So we speed yeah. with them. Right. Um, and, and the tool is good. Like we love it. And, and it, at a scales with the customer base. And, and I think that is something which, um, which, which is the foundation of a very scalable uh, business, especially in the market where we are with individual business owners. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, they found their perfect place, I think, and they manage really, really well. So how about your team? How many people are you? And are you getting enough talent or how is the situation over there? 
Yeah, that's a good question. We are 55 people. Mm -hmm. We are remote since 2018, so way before mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. The reason was also because we had so many customers from uh, the US and then Canada and Australia mm -hmm. and, and not really Germany. So they always said, like, you guys are remote and we're sitting in an office. And we're like, wait, we're not really like sitting in an office. We're not remote. <laughs> but then we had to go remote to really serve them. Um, yeah. For good customer service. And also we found really good developers that we didn't want to feel like satellite citizens, second class citizens. So we said, let's make it fair and everyone dials in. Today, um, we have people in the US, um, all over Europe, um, no office, uh, Africa as well, South Africa, um, the Philippines, Indonesia, Eastern Europe, Russia. Um, cool. Everywhere. And, and I think that's on the one hand, maybe is repelling to people that look for an office. Mm -hmm where everyone is sitting uh, together, which is also cool. Um, but we also are very appealing to, to a lot of people out there who, who also want to be independent um, and, and have an impact. And, and, and yeah, then we also like, we, we value the personal connection a lot. We, we have quarterly offsites where we fly together to cool locations. Um, cool. We've been to Prague um, recently to split on the Philippines. We had one. Next one is maybe in Barcelona or Lisbon. So yeah. we all fly together and we do with cool creators, cool stuff. We also flew customers in last time. We, we did karaoke together. Um, we draw, we drew together paintings, um, mm -hmm. which was quite <laughs> cool because no one could really like draw. Yeah. And, and that just like bonds us and makes us very excited and bridges these times where we're all on Slack or, or working remotely in all the different countries. Um, yeah. and, and the culture is actually much, much, much better than it was um with this ah that's really good to hear and you're always looking for good talent or i'm excited about passion and io and i can i can apply for a job or how is the situation yeah definitely we always look for great people um if it's on the marketing side or creators as well um that want to have us work with other people on creating something which is cool for mm -hmm. creator the creator economy but also of course product tech developers um we we are pretty flexible from the US all over to Indonesia. Cool. Um, we want to work with people of the right values and culture fit um, and, and really help them and to learn and grow so that we together yeah. can can create a big impact on the planet. Sounds great. So how do I get in touch with you on what's your favorite platform to, to shoot your message? Uh, that's a good question. I love WhatsApp. Um, <laughs> I love WhatsApp as well. Yeah. I would say you can just con contact me on, on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. you can send me an email. That's Matthias or Matthias for non-Germans. Oh yeah. Matthias. Pas <laughs> Matthias, yeah. M-A-W-T-H-I-A-S at passion.io. Yeah. And then I'm also going to share my WhatsApp number there usually as the first step. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Matthias, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the insights. It was a real pleasure to get to know all this in these points. I will absolutely will have a test on passion IO. I can see, or I, I want to see if we can crack it for the business world. And I will let you know what happened with leaders media on passion IO. So thank you. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you, Robert.